Austere, severe, cold, like a cemetery, the weight of the world, resting hulks, traps, rusty cathedrals, pure, distilled, out of time. These are just a few of the words and phrases that are used to describe Richard Serra's work, namely his large-scale sculpture work that he's most known for today. Throughout five decades of working, Serra has come up against no shortage of haters, praise, um, inconvenience, and hardship. But throughout it all, what has continued to drip out of him is an obsessive curiosity um, about space and about perception and the physical body's relationship to space to, I think, the most distilled and sincerest degree. Sarah's questioning of the world and subsequent exploration of the answer is, in my opinion, so crystal clear, it's hard to believe it's not written in some myth from a long forgotten text. It feels like legendary. And even though every artist's journey is different and there's no precedent set for perfection or a template for how things should be, it is just so satisfying to have examples like this. Today, we're gonna discuss his life and work some of the concepts behind it, and some of the processes and materials that he uses in frequency at the end of the video in our materials section. As you guys probably know by now, um, I don't really like necessarily like to give a timeline of facts. It's more just about a general overall sense of the work and about the artist's life and relationship to the work, um, where it sprang from potentially, and what we can learn from that and how it developed over time. I also prefer first-person interviews over biographies if I can find them, and there were tons of um, interviews specifically with Charlie Rose um, and Richard Serra, so that was really helpful for this episode. As always, I will link everything that I reference um, on the blog post that's specifically for this episode, uh, which will be linked down in the description. There will also be a transcript of this episode and an audio version on the podcast and interest radio as well. So if you haven't checked that out, definitely do that. Everything will be in the description. So Richard Serra was born in 1938 in San Francisco um, in a working class family with his mother, his father, and two brothers. He was the middle child, and this was actually pretty significant to his work because I feel like the classic middle child struggle is they want to win the affection and the attention of their parents. So in order to do this, um, he said in the 2001 interview with Charlie Rose that he started drawing to impress his parents, um, to please them, because his older brother was bigger and stronger, and this was something that he could do to, yeah, to impress them. So I guess in that way, he probably wouldn't say this, but it was kind of a love language. It was a, it was a way to relate to the world. So from a very young age, he was developing his artistic talent, and he could see that he had a knack for it and that he had talent for it, and everybody else could see it too. Um, his mother was kind of his number one fan, and at some point started dragging him from place to place and referring to him as Richard the Artist, um, much to his embarrassment and maybe a little sliver of pride. I think one of the most poignant moments in the 2001 interview is that is that first question that Charlie Rose asks Sarah, um, and he says, if I went back to the very beginning of Richard Sarah's life, what would be the earliest thing that I found that might suggest who he is today? And Sarah's reply is, probably a little kid walking along the beach for a couple of miles, turning around, walking back, looking at his footprints and being amazed that what was on the right in one direction when he reversed himself was now on his left, and it was completely different and he never got over it. Um, so he came up with that like immediately, lightning fast. So obviously this is a, clearly a memory that's been turning over and over in his mind for many years, and he's med meditated on it often since. Um, and to me, that quiet curiosity is kind of like the starting point to everything. Everybody has things that they think about that they kind of realize later on maybe in retrospect that are patterns throughout their lives. If you have any interest at all in art, philosophy of art, um, watch this interview because I think it's so important. And a lot of the things he says about art versus architecture and other forms of creative output, um, I personally could not agree with more. And I think probably some of them would be relatively unpopular today, but I think it's important to make the distinction between like his work and architecture uh, which is something that they talk about in that interview. So his father was not as overtly or easily impressed um, as his mother, but I think that was just like in alignment with the cultural sort of stereotypes of men and their sons at the time, I suppose. Um, that's just a speculation, but but he did support Richard in giving him these unforgettable experiences that would later on 
affect his work and have affected him since, um, like taking him to a shipyard to watch a ship launch. So he describes this ship launching, which I guess I'm assuming this was in the 1940s, early 1940s. Um, And so his father was a pipe fitter in a shipyard and um, he had been working on the ship and they were about to launch it. And so this was like a big deal because this enormous object that they've been working on for so long, um, this engineering feat, all this metal, all this tonnage, all this work, all this time is about to be launched into the bay, into the sea. And while it's an exciting event, it's also a time of great anxiety because there's no guarantee that um, when the ship goes in, because first it nose dives into the water, um, that it's going to come back up and float. And that kind of just depends on the, the quality of the engineering and if they did everything right. This enormous object, he calls it a skyscraper on its side, which if you've ever been inside one of Sarah's large scale sculptural works, that is kind of directly referenced in my opinion. Um, you know, it's on its side and then they put it on a path to go, like it's like plummeting at, a, at an increasing speed into the water. And so it nosedives and then it floats back up eventually. And in that moment, it's a great celebration. Um, and he witnessed all of that. He said there was like thousands of people there and um, they were like popping bottles and celebrating. And that became a recurring dream for him. Um, until this day. And so I think it's safe to say that it was an imprint and a huge part of what would become the puzzle of his life and work. He learned at that point that this enormous object, this enormously heavy object, could become lyrical and it could look like it was floating and it could float, even though it had all of this, uh, this weight to it. And that's kind of always, uh, I think, uh, an amazing thing when you realize that physics allows for for that kind of um, weightlessness of, of force against force. So it was a kind of early awakening for him. So Richard grew up. He It was time to go off to school. He did his bachelor's, I believe, at University of Santa Barbara, maybe one more place before that, maybe Berkeley. Then he went off to the Yale School of Art to do painting. So he'd sent in seven drawings to the Yale School of Art, and he was accepted Um, And over the summer before he left, he started working in a steel mill so that he could make pocket change to go off to school. Um, So again, this is this is a direct sort of like point on the map. Um, And all these sort of puzzle pieces are starting to come together. He didn't think of it as sculpture or a potential for sculpture at the time. It was just like where he was working. But it did give him an opportunity to get familiar with the material and start working with the material and understand how things fit together, how things worked. And um, it would obviously come back into play later on. It's kind of well known that Sarah kept up with his drawing practice throughout his life. But I think his paintings get omitted often. And I guess it wasn't like a huge part of his career, but he got his MFA in painting at Yale and started practicing translating his drawings into paintings at that point. And I think, you know, just at that at that time, if you wanted to become an artist, you were going to become a, a painter. So on a scholarship from Yale, he then travels to Paris in his young adult life because he says he's never seen a Brancusi. So he goes to Brancusi's atelier every day to draw, um, and he meets up with his good friend, Philip Glass, who also happens to be there at the same time. And you might be familiar with Philip Glass. He's a, an incredible composer who I hope to do a, a feature on eventually as well. And... There's like this funny story about them stalking Alberto Giacometti. So every day after dinner, they would go to this cafe that Giacometti would would chill at after work and um, or after his work day. And he would have like plaster in his hair. And he said that they would sit behind him and, and just watch him. And they became like groupies. And, you know, that's pretty heartwarming and adorable. But it was through Brancusi and Giacometti's influence Um, And his time spent in Paris that Sarah became very interested in process over results. And this would also, you know, stay with him for the rest of his career. And um, he also worked with Philip Glass often on projects in his studio in New York when they got back. It also kind of pivoted him to become more interested in sculpture over painting. He says the reason, the main reason why this was, was that he got to see Velasquez, um, while he was in Europe. And when he saw Velasquez and he, he witnessed this painting, and if you ever have witnessed a Velasquez painting in, per, in person, it's like, you know, it's pretty um, otherworldly. It doesn't entirely seem possible. But he said, you know, he was never going to be able to do that. 
So why even try? But when he saw Brancusi and he saw Giacometti, he thought he had a shot. So he then traveled to Italy and started experimenting and working with kind of um, playful things like live and dead animals. He did a whole show with live and dead animals, uh, which he admits was just experimentation and play and considers it student work, but it was important to his overall process. Basically, he wanted to shed the skin that he had created at Yale uh, because academic constraints can be very limiting. So when Sarah returned to New York uh, from Europe, from all of his travels, he said there was a warehouse that was unloading hundreds of tons of rubber outside of his loft into the street. So he called up the head of the company and was like, hey, you know, can I have this this material? And they gave it to him. And he said it was like receiving a grant um, because it became his material that, of choice that he used. And rubber is actually pretty expensive. So it really is like receiving a grant. So he lugs all this stuff up to his studio loft in, in New York and starts writing down this list of verbs. To roll, to cut, to fold, to bend, etc. And then he took the center of one piece of rubber and just lifted it up. And it kind of held itself up. And so it was in this project. He, ma- he also made a, a series of 16 millimeter films, which is how I became familiar with his work, um, of him just holding or like grabbing a piece of lead that was falling, things like that. And so this was like the first direct... Um, way that he was relating the body to uh, objects in space and how they how they kind of play together and um, doing it in a very distilled sort of like what is the essence of the idea kind of way so that piece uh, with the rubber uh, lifted in the center is called to lift and he still owns that piece today so you can you can tell that he's he was really proud of that moment it was kind of a breakthrough for him so this became the obvious subtext for things that would come later on um, obvious only in retrospect, of course, but but it was a great time of play and a great time of experimentation. And another really notable piece from this time period is the Splash Molten Lead Works. So basically, he uh, did a performance at Leo Castelli Gallery, which was um, his main dealer of him basically heating up a bunch of lead, molten lead, and splashing it on the wall um, in the corners. Um, again, these this is a direct line of like the physical body relating to material, relating to space in a non-contrived way. Um, in other words, using the laws of the universe, using the laws of physics to determine how things fall. He also did a couple of casts of shipwreckage and a collaboration piece with Philip Glass where they cut loads of lead and wood um, on the floor as an exploration of process. He doesn't explicitly say why he started using lead, um, but I don't know, like maybe it was just another thing that was on the street or something. Also in the late 60s, when he was doing the um, the splashing of the lead, he was also working on the prop pieces. So uh, prop is one of the more, more notable ones, 1968. So after the splashing lead came the House of Cards, and this was another career-defining moment for Richard Serra. Um, in 1969, he basically took um, four 48-inch square pieces of lead plate um, and lean them up against each other and prop them up against each other so that they were only held up by their own weight and were completely self-sustaining in their ability to do that. Maybe people don't realize just how heavy these plates are, um, but as someone who's worked with lead sheets myself, I'm sure it took, because I've seen these in person, and I'm sure it took three people just to move one of the plates. So it's no easy feat, but he calls this a defining moment for him because it became a window into how to build um, yeah, without welding, without stitching, as he says, without making any joints or connections at all. And just, again, using the, the laws of physics um, to be able to bring things together. I also think it was definitive because his first wife, Nancy Graves, um, he tells the story that when he showed her this piece um, in his studio and he was like, you know, this is it. She was like, Richard, that's not art. You can't show that. And he said within a year they were divorced. And if you Google Nancy's work, if you're unfamiliar, um, it'll provide really interesting context for that um, statement. So then, you know, that was the turn of the decade. And in the 1970s, that's when he began working with larger scale sheets of lead. So then after the 1970s was a really um, prolific time for Sarah, came the 1980s. um, And he was commissioned by the GSA and the NEA to propose and create a supposedly permanent sculpture piece for the plaza in front of the federal building in New York City. And so he he created a piece called Tilted Arc. 
And this is probably something that you've heard about, um, especially if you were alive in the 1980s. A tilted arc is essentially a single piece of steel that's bent um, at a certain angle, and it's 120 feet long, 12 feet high, and two and a half inches thick. So we're talking about an enormous piece of metal and um, an enormously heavy uh, object and uh, a huge feat of engineering just to get it there into that spot. So over a period of about four to six years, there was a lot of backlash against the sculpture. People thought it was ugly. They thought it was an eyesore. They thought it was a security hazard, just like everything under the sun that you could imagine. Um, there were a number of arguments against it, and um, this was after it had already been proposed, accepted, created, um, you know, planned, and then placed. There was like all these hearings and all this drama, and um, they had suggested for Sarah to move it to another place. But since the piece was created specifically for that area, um, to take it anywhere else would render it completely meaningless and useless. I linked on the blog post a really interesting film that was made by, I'm assuming just like a random filmmaker and musician that was living in New York City at the time and was kind of fascinated by the whole thing. And he took it upon himself to document um, the process of the unfolding of it getting taken down. But he managed to get some footage of it while it was still up. And you start to watch this film and there's this sound, this like ambient kind of like echoey sound. And you're kind of like, okay, this is weird. Like this is supposed to be just a, a film about... Um, about this trial and everything. So what is, what's going on with this noise? And then he starts uh, talking and he says that he um, conducted a series of acoustical experiments at the Tilted Arc. And so he wanted to see how it would play with sound waves. And so he bounced a sound off of the Tilted Arc and it would hit the, the entrance of the Federal Plaza building. And then it would ricochet back to the Tilted Arc and then it would come back again. And it was sort of this um, like, what are they called? The sound bowls that people use and an echo. And that was happening just naturally. And he, he captured that sound. And once you realize that that's what it was, you're like, whoa, like this thing was, was mysterious. It was, it was magical. And it created this sort of amphitheater effect. And so also in the film, there's like, you know, footage of the trials and there's footage of Richard Serra. And you can tell that he's not having any of it. He was very upset and, um, you know, raw about it, which is understandable. And this created kind of a precedent set at that point, and I'm not sure if it still is, that the government can essentially use public funds to commission a work and then destroy it the next day if they want to. So from that point on, Sarah was kind of known as having a, an aggressive personality. His work didn't have a very good um, rapport with the public, obviously, at that point. Um, and he was kind of becoming more infamous than famous. And then a few years later, in 1988, a workman was injured Another one actually died on the job while deinstalling at Leo Castelli Gallery, one of Richard's works. Um, and so after that, he basically was like, all right, like, I need analysis, he calls it, um, which is just another word for therapy. And um, it was a really tough time for him and I think uh, most people, if not everyone. So after the 80s came the dawn of the 90s and it was a new time. It was a new uh, energy. It was a new generation that was starting to become old enough to experience art. Um, in a different way, and I'm referring to Gen X. And so he said that at that point, um, and I think partially it's just because like his work happened to be in vogue at that point. You know, think about the 90s, the minimalism, Kate Moss, Calvin Klein. And so I think just the nature of his work in general was very appealing um, to the young people at the time, and they were starting to grow up to the point where they could appreciate it. And he said that they would sit inside of the the works and just like, you know, stay there and experience them in a different way. And he hadn't seen that before. But he started to have some success again and things started to kind of dissipate in terms of all the drama of the 80s. Um, he had a retrospective of his drawings in 1991. He was showing major exhibitions in Europe, namely Germany and Spain. He actually um, gets his steel done in Germany, uh, which we'll talk about <clears throat> in the materials section. But he was winning prizes, winning accolades, and also, this is random, but kind of funny. So when I was looking at um, Richard Serra's work and I was trying to get stills of his films from like the 19, uh, late 1960s and early 70s, I typed in Richard Serra film. And so on Google, the first thing that came up was actually this film called Cremaster 3. And I thought it was some sort of mistake. And I was just like, oh, there must be somebody else named Richard Serra. 
Um, but then I looked more into it and it's by Matthew Barney. It's like this five part, uh, video series exhibition, um, from 2002 and Richard Serra starred in it. And the log line is that it's a part zombie movie, part gangster film. And I didn't actually watch it cause it's three hours long, just the third installment. Um, and also you have to buy the DVD, but it looks crazy and just wild. And I was like, that is so random, but you know, if anybody out there has seen it, definitely comment below. Tell me if it's worth watching. Um, especially for the Richard Serra part, because apparently he is like the top build actor in it. So he was having a lot of success in the early 2000s as well. Um, he's only one of two artists that have ever had two retrospectives at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, the other one is Frank Stella. I think the biggest status symbol of all probably is that the, the MoMA actually built their second floor to the specs that would support Richard's work permanently. Um, so it was built for him, essentially. So if nothing else, that was a mark of... Um, great success and great appreciation by the art world. So now we're going to move into the materials portion of the video. Um, and I'm not going to get too deep into it. He used obviously more things than just rubber, lead and steel plate, but that's what we're going to talk about since those are the most, I think, important and interesting. Um, so we'll start with rubber and rubber is actually a really interesting material. It has a lot of, um, qualities that are very specific to rubber. It's dense and thick and it's non-toxic and it's a natural material and it holds itself up very well. Um, and it absorbs shock, it absorbs a bit of sound, and um, it doesn't tear easily, it's very resilient. It insulates a little bit, and that's why people use it as like, you know, they use recycled tires for the sides of houses and like earth chips and stuff. So lead, this is the material I know the most about from my own experiments um, with it as an artist. I just personally think it's the most beautiful material in the world. And when he works with it, he doesn't even take the industrial scale off. So when you see like House of Cards, that is just lead plate straight from the factory. It has the scale on it still. Um, it's not cleaned off. And the, the best thing about lead is that it's soft um, and you can like roll it out like dough or like leather hard clay. Um, you can also like tear it. You can cut it really easily. The thicker it gets, it gets harder, obviously. It's extremely dense and um, heavy, but and it is you know easily kind of uh, ruined because of its softness. Like you can make dents in it really easily, um, but you know I guess in his case he could always just order another lead plate of the same size, and no one would even know the difference if that happened. The other great thing about it is that it's inert, so it doesn't have a lot of like organic volatile organic compounds. Um, so things aren't going to be going into the air. You're not going to get any oxidation, oxidization, oxidation. Um, the scale is just from like the machines and everything, but, um, so it doesn't rust and you can basically put anything on it and it won't change it. So when I was using lead, um, I used it to create the sculpture that I wanted to create because I needed something that was not going to require any welding or any connective points. Um, other than like, I actually sewed it, like hand sewed it. because it's so soft, you can actually do that. But anyway, I put gilding size on it and then I covered it in silver leaf. And so that was um, kind of a reference to alchemy and like turning lead into gold and lead being the premium materia. But it's great because it's never going to rust and it's going to stay like that forever. And again, it's like something that doesn't require conservation. It doesn't require um, any like upkeep at all. It just kind of sits there and it is a natural material just like steel. So the last one we'll talk about is steel plate. And so he used a very specific steel called Corten steel. And this is another word for weathering steel. Um, and so that essentially just means that it has a particular weathering pattern, an oxidization pattern. I don't even know if I'm saying that word right. It sounds wrong. Maybe it's right. I don't know. But you know what I mean? Like um, when steel oxidizes, it rusts. Right. And so um, it has a specific pattern for that and a way of doing that where it takes about eight to 10 years, depending on if it's outside or if it's inside, to turn a certain color. So it goes through a sort of uh, particular color pattern. So that's all I have for you today for Richard Serra. I hope you enjoyed this episode on him and his work. Um, again, just an overview of everything and sort of the point A to point B to point C to point 
D, right? Um, and just kind of seeing how that progression was made and how things kind of end up being causalities. I think Sarah might be my all-time favorite artist just because I really value clarity and I value, um, I guess, purity as a, as a bit of a virtue in that way. And I think he he really nailed it. <laughs> he nailed it. So if you haven't already subscribed to this channel, if you like the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel, share the video, comment down below your thoughts. Um, and if you haven't already seen my other episode on sculptor Ruth Asawa, I think you'll really enjoy it. Check it out. I'll leave it right here and I'll see you guys next time. Ciao.